Hi, my name is Phil, and I just built a bridge. To keep the water runoff from the driveway from flowing down to the foundation of the house, which is quite a bit lower than the driveway, we've removed a bunch of concrete, including the steps down to the concrete slab in front of the kitchen door. We put in pavers along the side of the house, and we built a ditch. I like to think of it as a very shallow moat, and all moats need a bridge, right? Someday I'll add a radio-operated pump and a basin so we can have water flowing in the ditch by remote control. <laughs> the distance the bridge spans is almost exactly eight feet. And before the ditch was there, I had built a temporary ramp to cross over the dirt and mud that was being washed onto the steps every time it rained. I wanted a nice, solid, and decorative bridge with a curve to it. Especially because of the curve, it needed handrails so nobody slipped and fell in the winter. During my research, I read a book about the 19th century technique used to build iron bridges. It was riveting. <laughs> but I decided to use wood instead and overbuild the bridge quite a bit. It would be strong enough with 2x8 joists running longitudinally, but I used three 2x10s, screwed them together to take out some of the warp, and cut either end off at an angle in an approximation of the curve I wanted. That way I could have them all match. I don't have a bandsaw at the moment, so my cuts were straight lines, and I used my wide smoothing plane to round over those angles. I love this old smoothing plane. I believe it was made in the late 40s to the 50s. For you collectors out there, it has all the hallmarks of a Type 19 Stanley Bailey number no. four and a half. For fun, I also pulled out my number no. four smoothing plane to play with it and see how it does. I just got it, and that one needs quite a bit of restoration, but with a sharp iron, they both make wispy thin cuts. I gave the curve of the bridge a radius that gets longer at one end. In other words, as the bridge goes towards the house, the curve is gentler. The reason for this is that the bridge drops in level, so if it had a constant radius, it would get fairly steep when it reached the lower level of the sidewalk in front of the kitchen door. Because the wood of the joists was twisting, I used blocking to not only keep the structure together, but to hold the three joists parallel and straight. Galvanized brackets and screws on the inside corners and ledger lock screws through the joists into the ends of the blocking finished that job. Since the blocking isn't supporting anything and the joists run the length of the bridge, I didn't worry about the number and spacing of fasteners.
Since I had a bunch of planks from the temporary bridge, I reused those, and where they had cupped, I flipped them over and screwed them down. Amy and I dug in some offcuts from the blocks we were using on the block wall to support the higher end of the bridge at the driveway. The lower end of the bridge sits on the plastic edge that holds the pavers for the sidewalk in place. So now I had a bridge, but it really needed handrails, and I didn't want to make them straight since the bridge was curved, and I couldn't make them in a curve that didn't match the bridge. Remember, the bridge has an increasing radius as you go towards the house. So I cut some redwood into strips, set some blocks on the bridge, and covered everything with plastic. This allowed me to clamp the strips into a slightly broader curve that matched the bridge. At first I was afraid to cross the bridge before I added the handrails, but I got over it. I glued the strips together with Type Bond 3 because it should work well out in the weather. If you're wondering why I added the blocks, the handrails should extend past the bridge a little on either end, so I needed the room to clear the sidewalk when I clamped the handrails to the bridge, and I also wanted the handrails to have a slightly larger curve visually.
Once the glue had dried, I planed the handrails smooth and rounded over the edges on the top to make them comfortable to hold on to. I know this looks like I'm going the wrong way, but this is a climb cut. The disadvantages of a climb cut are the bit pushes the router away from the wood, or climbs out of the cut, and the bit has a longer path to clear out the chips, so you have to go slower or risk burning the wood and heating the bit. The advantage is a climb cut is less likely to tear out, and since I'm using redwood and it tears out easily, a climb cut is a better choice. I made some spacers and rail posts and screwed them to the bridge with some really long structural screws. The top of the handrail should be between 34 and 38 inches from the top of the decking. And in case it needs to be wheelchair accessible, there should be at least 36 inches clearance between the handrails. Once I clamped the handrails into position, I marked the posts and cut the ends to line up with the curve of the handrails and I sanded a bevel into the posts to make them look a bit neater. I originally planned to put cross braces between the handrail supports, but when I gave them a push they seemed pretty stiff and strong, so I'm leaving them off. Since this bridge isn't high up, it's practically sitting on the ground, it doesn't need a mid-rail, bottom rail, or balusters. There's no real fall hazard to either side. I might add a bit of strength at some point if the handrails become more wiggly, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Amy stained the bridge, and we put a special grit in the stain for the walking surface for traction. We're happy with how it turned out. Let us know in the comments 
what you think. If you enjoyed this video, or even if you were hoping there would be more dad jokes, please like and subscribe. And don't forget to click on the bell next to the word subscribe so you get notified when I upload another video. Thanks for watching. My friends all told me to build a bridge to nowhere, but I didn't give in to peer pressure. <laughs> now that's wrong on so many levels.